Hello, good morning. Good morning. Something about myself. I'm from Ney. Hola. I'm from Colombia. And let's dive right in. Let's talk about surveys. First, survey is not design. I keep hearing over and over people, you know, I'm going to do a survey. You're like, oh, you're going on site and doing something like, no, no, I'm just going to sit on my computer and do stuff. Well, you're doing design. Um, survey is all kinds of surveys, you know. Uh, electricians do, you know, go to a building, do a, a survey. Plumbers do a survey. Sometimes people approach you to see if they can take a survey on, you know, some topic, ask questions. It's just a method used to uh, collect data. Uh, on our case, when we talk about a Wi-Fi site survey, we're talking uh, about being on site collecting data relevant to Wi-Fi, to what we do. Um, we'll talk briefly about you know, these three types of uh, surveys, the pre-deployment survey, the post-deployment one, and the remediation surveys. Uh, the pre-deployment one, um, yes, there is a life cycle of, uh, of a network, and uh, we start with defining you know, a project. That uh, definition involves a lot of questions. As Martin mentioned, uh, Troy uh, mentioned, you know, we have to ask the right questions. Questions, questions, questions. When you ask a client, what do you want? Wi-Fi. Oh, where do you want it? Everywhere. For what device? Every device. That's it. That's usually how the uh, scope is described at the beginning. Part of that uh, definition is finding the requirements. What are, we, what are the requirements of a project? Once we uh, get that defined, of course, we're going to use software. We're going to use uh, Ekahow. We're going to use IBWay. We're going to use Air Magnet, whatever software you use uh, to do your design. And then you're going to do, you're doing a UC on me? Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think we sit in the front row? Yeah. yeah. OK. You're right here. Uh, absolutely. Then you have to do a pre-deployment survey. You have to go on site, not only about Wi-Fi. You have to go and walk around, measure distances, double check materials, look at the ceilings, look at the cabling, look at many things. So there are several things that have to be considered at this stage. Of course, one of the uh, ideal things is that if you have the ability to go on site, and you know, visit and look and measure and take notes and take pictures, then that will help you feed that information back into your design. All this is pre-deployment. You haven't sold equipment, you haven't installed the equipment, you're just you know, putting together a proposal. You're gathering information, you're doing a site survey, pre-deployment to make sure that you fit that information back into your design. Sometimes, yes, the uh, predictive software will give us an idea of what we have, what we need. But when you go on site and you do an AP on a stick, you realize that maybe things are not how the uh, software will portray it. So you have to feed information back into it. Of course, all of that uh, analysis will help your design be more solid. Doing an AP on a stick is controversial. Some people say, just say, oh, that's stupid. You're wasting your time. Some others are like, oh, I always do an AP on a stick. Like, always? Oh, yes. For every project? Every project. For every building? Every building. Every, every AP on every project. I go an AP on a stick, every single one of them. That's what some people do. So AP on a stick, there are many ways to do it wrong. To do an AP on a stick, you have to be on site with the AP, the antennas that you're going to be using for that project. Don't bring a Cisco AP and do an AP on a stick for an Aruba deployment. It doesn't work that way. Don't bring any Aruba AP to a specific Aruba 335 deployment. You just have to be as precise as you're going to be on the real life, on the real deployment. That implies, yes, being on site. Being on site is not always easy. Sometimes you have to fly two hours, spend a couple nights at a hotel. You have to schedule time to be there. You have to have special access. Uh, bring the equipment. If you have multiple APs that you are presenting, then you're going to have to do AP on a stick on all of them. That implies 
doing a, bringing equipment that's it's not out there. We in this industry, we're a fairly new industry and we have to come up with a lot of stuff that is not there. So people come up and create their own stuff, flexible. And how accurate do you have to be? Well, as accurate as you're gonna be in real life. So does that mean you have to put the APs where they're gonna be? Yes. How close? Well, as close as you can. Does that mean you have to bring it up 10, 15, 30 feet up in the air? Yes. And this, what if it's a different type of AP? Well, then you bring that AP. What if it's a different type of antenna that I'm gonna be using? Then you bring that antenna and you put it where that's gonna go in real life. Each model behaves differently. The antenna, the radiation patterns will behave differently. And you have to put them out. That requires a lot of work. It's a lot of work to do that. And always the question is, who's gonna pay for it? Is the client who's trying to get a proposal from you gonna pay you to do this? Like, I haven't bought anything from you. Just do what you have to do and you know, maybe you'll get the job or not. What if it's your employer? Is your employer willing to foot the bill and kind of put some money up front and you know, hoping that he's gonna get the job? What if you are your employer? If you are self-employed, then now you have to put resources towards putting a proposal together that involves bringing equipment, being on site, traveling, flying, going through you know, security with all this gear, and scheduling time. You cannot just put an AP on stick and what click, what click, what click in every location in a warehouse while they're in production. It involves bringing gear. You have to carry batteries, you have to bring cables, you have to bring adapters, you have to bring, 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 bring a whole bunch of stuff. So that's just a little bit on the uh, pre-deployment uh, survey. So post-deployment, after you feed that pre-deployment data into your design and then you know, finally, hopefully you get the job and then you do the deployment, now you have to do a post-deployment survey or a validation survey. Yes, you also have to ask questions. You have to schedule time to come and do it. You have to make sure. And if you did it right the first time around, then this validation should just be you know, a walk in the park. Just you know, walk, click, walk, click, and kind of compare with you the data you already have. You're making sure you are meeting requirements. Yes, you need floor plans all the time. Some of these are tricky. I used this on my uh, minions when I was training high school kids to do surveys. I put them on one side like, okay, go at the end of the hallway and then turn right. And then they'll start walk, 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 and then suddenly they were back in the same place. How'd you get here? Like, you're walking in circles. A lot of these buildings we have to survey, they're just difficult. We're not familiar with them. We end up, you know, in the back of the room, the front of the room. We have to do a lot of walk, click, walk, click, walk, click. Yes, we have to go places. We walk for hours and do multiple kilometers a day. And then we get data. We're on site collecting data. And we have to analyze data. We'll talk a little bit more about analyzing data later. Let's talk about the most fun survey out there, the remediation surveys. That's the one you're not in a rush, you're just putting a proposal together in a pre-deployment, or you already did the, the deployment and you did a pre-deployment survey. This one is when the client is desperate. Somebody implemented something, it's not working, they call you, fix it, now! There's pressure, they're angry, they're upset, they spend so much money in a project and it's not working, then you have to go do a survey, you don't have floor plans, you don't know who installed it, you don't know who designed it, perhaps nobody, it was just deployed, it's out there hanging, then you have to go and survey, what click, what click, and then gather data. And then the fun part begins. <laughs> We have to dress up. It's like Halloween sometimes when we go to certain places. You have to wear boots, you have to wear helmets, you have to wear all kinds of things. You cannot go in just every place. And usually, like if you're gonna do an auditorium and you go to survey the auditorium, oh, you cannot go in there right now. You have to come back when nobody is around. You go do a survey when nobody is around and everything looks good. Everything measures fine, and if you're doing a, you know, throughput testing, then everything looks great. They won't let you go when there are users and devices and things are happening in the network. That implies a lot of walking. Sometimes we don't get floor plans. We have to come up with our own floor plans. 
Sometimes we have to drive around bigger areas and gather information and look at information and start making decisions on what are we going to do about it? Do we need more? Do we need different type of APs? Do we need less? Do we move them up? Do we, do we move them down? Some of those outdoor surveys uh, I've done with uh, GPS. GPS, you know, a lot of people think that an outdoor survey needs a GPS. GPS is just to tell the tool where you are in the map. Well, in this case, I use one, but not all the time is really successful. I did this in Vegas at night. I was not drunk walking in the middle of the street. <laughs> Although my GPS kind of fed information into a house saying like, you are here. A GPS, uh, a survey with GPS, like survey with no hands. You set up a GPS, it starts feeding coordinates into the software, and then you walk. Walk up or drive around, and then it gives you. I was not walking on top of these roofs. And look, it's 29 meters off from where I really was. So sometimes that's not the best solution. But if you're in a mine, when you have no reference points, you don't know where you are, you better be off 10, 15 meters than you. Know. Here on the street, you can just walk, click. I'm on this corner, click. I'm by this tree, click. I'm by this stoplight, click. And we have to walk a lot also when we are doing outdoor surveys and we walk and walk and walk. A lot. That's Times Square, we'll look at it uh, in a little bit. And uh, I was not, I like to walk until I had to do a survey in San Jose, the heart of Silicon Valley, and I had to do 70 kilometers. A survey that requires 70 kilometers of walking I don't know if Mike, he just did the Santiago de Compostela El Camino. I don't know if that would be feasible, but when you're doing a survey and you carry gear and you have computers and you have stuff, then you have to rely on Mr. Parsons' favorite survey tool, the Segway. And I didn't have to transport the Segway from Utah all the way down to San Jose. You can just rent them. Just go and you know, rent one of these uh, uh, Segway tour places, and we do have some adapters that you can attach it, and then you have you have your, your device, and then it's much easier uh, to do a, uh, I think it's not working, but let me That's just. That's a good restaurant. That is a good restaurant. It is. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to do um, a lot of the, uh, of the uh, data collection relying on, on some other things, because now uh, comes the fun part, which is the data analysis. When you get, uh, surveying is easy, collecting data is not that hard. Uh, you know, as Mr. Parsons said, you know, we could train a monkey to do survey, collect data. Well, we haven't, but we have trained high school kids to do survey. It's pretty close, pretty similar. <laughs> so once you get that data, what do you do with it? That's the, the fun part. You have to come and collect data. Like this one, for instance, it's at a, uh, at a Gatwick Airport. And uh, yes, we have eight SSIDs advertised on both, two, four, and five. So that'll tell you a little bit about overhead. And yes, this is a small industry. Some of the guys that are uh, first time uh, here, they say, oh, this is pretty cool. You know, I'm new to Wi-Fi and these guys are all welcoming and stuff. It's a small community too. In classes, I've met guys that you know, are working on these projects and you know, we've talked about it, made recommendations They're like, well, the owner said, we cannot do this. We cannot disable this. American Airlines or British Airways, they have this requirement and then we have to keep web. We have to keep ticket. We have to, we have to. And we printed thousands of booklets with the instructions and everybody's got them. And if changing a WPA password and trying to get people into that one X is gonna require X amount of work. We had uh, at a school district, you know, 30,000 devices and all with WPA2. All you needed to get the password was to get on Google. And there was the password for the, for the network. And changing that requires work, work, work. A lot of this stuff is just a lot of work. And what do we do with all of this data? Hard to clean up something like this. Hard to clean up <laughs> something like that. So one of the things with the Segway uh, is that uh, I could carry more stuff with me. I, of course, uh, doing 70 kilometers, I probably underplanned or overestimated what I could do with the tools that I had. And I was just thinking like, oh, I'll just do all in one survey. 
And once you start doing a survey and collecting spectrum data and protocol data, and you're out there in the open, in the sun, computer gets hot really quick. And files get big very fast. So you have to start changing your, your method. Um, I broke the whole city into like 22 sections. And then I started doing a section at a time. We were thinking of doing like, you know, four by four blocks and but even like that it was still big so we started going smaller and smaller and just manipulating the files was much easier of course when you're doing indoor surveys my favorite tool you already know is the survey tray i carry it everywhere that's the first thing i pack even before my computer how are you going to do well i need it it's my bag it's my tray i carry a lot of stuff with it I do presentations in it, you know? <laughs> the first one I did, I was uh, showing how not to drop your computer having the tray. Guess what I did? Drop my computer <laughs> in front of a bigger audience. So um, another thing I learned, uh, of course, you're out there in the open. You wear sunglasses. And then, you know, they are polarized. You can barely see the screen. So now you have to have, like, some... Uh, because also in the uh, Segway, sometimes there are branches and there are you know, other things that you have to worry about. I realize that us humans, we get headphones in our ears, we become idiots. Like you're surveying out there and people are like in another world. And there was somebody coming at me. I stopped. Hey, excuse me. Hello. And they were just like walking towards me. And you just have to watch for so many things when you're surveying. If you're in a warehouse, there are cars going back and forth all the time. It's dangerous. Um, one of the tools that I use is this NanoPi. You know, Jerry has put this together. We've, we're working with this. If you have to do a, a throughput a test, setting this up on the network and start transferring data to a server, like this is very handy. Of course, you know, the, the, the G2, this is a must-have tool. Sometimes you have to walk around and just take, you know, measurements in, in different areas. Uh, another thing that I uh, learned is that batteries. You need to get a, a battery like this, and it charges my computer like twice. So I can go basically one day nonstop with two computers, couple batteries, Segway, and, you know, it will last me all day, if need be. Sometimes you, know, you worry about the Segway breaking, but sometimes it's the computer, sometimes but batteries and things that we have to consider. So of those questions that we have to ask before every survey, either a pre-deployment survey or a post-deployment survey or a remediation survey, these are just a few things we have to consider. Floor plans. Yeah, that's one of the big struggles. Usually we don't get one. Uh, we have to get a good scale. We have to get uh, good measurements. What channels are we going to scan during that survey? We don't want to spend you know, time scanning channels that are not being used. Are we going to do an active survey? Active surveys are sometimes controversial as AP on a stick. Some people tell you, throughput test, that's stupid. What are you trying to prove? Well, the throughput on the network? Like, you know, one of the big uh, mistakes with active uh, surveys is trying to decide what the health of a network is, like based on a ping test. On a ping, uh, like you know, ping is not the best tool to. You know, it will help you, but it's not going to tell you how healthy the network is. It will give you some statistics, some idea in time, that time when you were doing a survey. You're doing a throughput test, and I go to a school and I do it in the afternoon where there are no kids in the school and every AP has like, you know, two users connected, then everything looks great. I come the next day in the morning when everybody is in school and all the kids are downloading videos and doing online training and my throughput doesn't look too good. Besides, clients are going to connect whatever they want. And I can be connected to an access point, walk multiple uh, areas, walk under many multiple APs and I'm still connected to my old AP and it's going to show me a bad experience. And people say, oh, this place is bad. There's throughput here. It's horrible. It's like, you're right under an access point. That day when I did the survey, maybe I was not connected to this one. 
Spectrum. Do we need to collect spectrum when we're doing a survey? Of course, with the Sidekick, like, yes, it comes with a strap. It's a great tool. Everybody, you know, some have used the belt clip. They put it on their waist and they walk around, but, you know, it's kind of awkward. Sometimes it, the, the strap wiggles a little bit. Uh, we came up with this plate that holds the Sidekick there. Of course, it has to be exposed because it gets warm. Um, I realized <coughs> the hard way, I actually did a shock test on it. I was on my Segway on a, on a sidewalk, and you know, after a while, like this bump, and I hear this, bah, 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 and like, what's going on? My sidekick was being dragged, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> like, oh, I stop, and it still works. So I guess, you know, I did a, a unplanned, you know, shock proof. You know, what do they call it when they drop the phone? Drop test, yes. A drag test. Um, power, yes. What are we going to use for power? Uh, if you're doing an AP on a stick, you can, I've seen guys walking around with a UPS, like a two-rack UPS, like, wow. Well, I put it at the bottom of the, my stick, and then it's not. You know, those AP on sticks get top-heavy quick. You have big antennas and APs, you put it you know, 30 feet up in the air, yes, it's gonna, it can flip. Uh, cabling, when we're doing surveys, remember, we're not just looking at Wi-Fi data. We're you know, doing uh, a survey of the facilities. You know, what's the cabling infrastructure? What type of clients? You know, vendors always take pride on their products. Oh, our APs, they do A, B, C, D, G, A, G, L, R, A, to Z. They do everything. Well, that's important, but it's also very important what clients can do. More often than not, we find problems where, yes, the AP has every option checked in and it's all good, but then the clients cannot do it, cannot see channels, cannot do certain things. That's to consider. Reports. Yes, after a survey, either one, we have to do a report. To whom are we going to present that report? Who's the audience of that report? Is it management? You know, people don't know Wi-Fi, but those are the ones who approve the purchase. Or the owner who doesn't know Wi-Fi, but he's the one that writes the check. We have to know how to write those reports. Compensation, I'm not talking about money this time. We're talking about compensate, you know, calibrate type of thing. There's a document Mr. Parsons wrote with a pretty good documentation about compensation. One thing is what I see with my psychic. One thing is what I see when I send one of my tall guys with the computer holding it up here. And then I go the following day with the same computer, but I'm down here. Those 50, 60 centimeters will matter. You know, we have to uh, have that in mind. Pictures, when we're talking about uh, pictures for documentation, that's great. But legally, in some places, we cannot just walk around taking pictures. There's a lot of restrictions and NDAs and places where we walk in, we cannot just take pictures. So like I had some guys at a, at a bank, they stole, they store, uh, they st not stole. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what they were gonna steal. They were gonna steal a map. Sometimes we have to steal maps. Oh, I need a map. Oh, can I have a map? Can I get it? No, can take a picture of the fire escape route. Like, oh, so, you know, we try to come. But they store uh, gold in that bank. So they needed to do a survey, like, okay, we need a plan, plan. we're not gonna give you a floor plan for the bank where we store gold. <laughs> like, okay, can I like sketch one? Nope, can I write one? Can I take picture of one? You cannot memorize what's here. I mean, tell me where I need a piece. Like, okay, how am I gonna do a survey and know what I need or do a predictive if I don't have any? Well, sometimes we have to get creative. Um, tools, yes, I mentioned some of the tools. There are many other things we have to consider. Um, licensing. Usually we just worry about the APs and then we get the APs and then we realize there is no enough licenses on the controller. The controller is maxed out. There's no room for more. And then, uh, of course, budget. Most of the times we think like budget means, oh, there's not enough money, here's the limited budget. Like in some public institutions, the problem is that there's too much money. Like. We have this $3,000, $300,000 that we have to spend before the end of the year, or we're going to lose funding next year, so we have to spend them. Like, oh, vendor's dream. Like, oh, I'll help you spend $300,000. And then we had to struggle. Cause like, okay, where do we spend $350,000? Do we buy servers? We bought new servers last year. Do we buy switches? 
we have all the infrastructures, you know, gig, 10 gig, backbone, cabling, everything is like, sometimes we have to upgrade stuff that is upgraded because, you know, we have money to spend. That's, you know, one of the pro weird problems we have. Um, of course, ours, some companies, they cannot just stop because you're doing a survey. They're like, nope, they give you this window. You can come from midnight to six in the morning on Christmas day, that's it. <laughs> How about, nope, that's it. There's nothing else that you can do. And we have to schedule those things and sometimes do it during those hours because that's the only window we have. So let's look at, uh, show you a couple of ways that we can, uh, let me just get out of this one here. How am I doing time-wise, Mr. Parsons? Five minutes? All right. Ah, no, we're good. Okay, so I guess I have to mirror. Ugh, is it gonna die? Okay, still there? Oh, of course, my echo died when I changed resolution. Tiger? <laughs> we we gotta fix it. <laughs> as soon as I plug in a projector, it's like. Brrr. Okay, let's open it. Yeah. It's exact. Uh -oh. Hey, that. Uh -oh. Easy. Are you showing us an evaluation? Yeah, this is a trial. Yay! <laughs> Worry not. While this opens, any questions? You can ask Nick. <laughs> Where is Nick? Uh, yes, sir. Absolutely. The, oh, the, the question is, you know, access, right? Yeah. About access and keys and yes. And uh, sometimes, like especially when, uh, when many times, many places, they assign somebody to be with us at all times. Like we were doing a, a report on one of these stuff and then I asked one of the guys, we're at a conference room, projector plugged in and you know, my, my echo house on the back and they're like, oh, uh, can I use your restroom before we start? Oh yeah, yeah, sure, it's you know, down the hall and then I look and oh, I know he's like, no, no, I'll go with you. Like, no, 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 I'm good, I, I can go by myself. Like, no, I mean, I have to go with you. Like, you cannot just go to the bathroom by yourself. And sometimes you go access a place and you cannot get back in because every door in and out needs special access. All that has to be scheduled. And in some places I've been locked up because they give you access and then you go in and then you take your time and then everybody leaves. By the time you leave, it's like, oh, your card has been deactivated at six o'clock and you're like, oh, six o one and you're locked in waiting for somebody to let you out. Okay, so in this case, um, I have APs. I have almost 5,000 access points that I saw while I was on this survey. It's not that big. This is, this is a small one. This is one of the 22. I you know, did it in 52 minutes, so I did you know, seven kilometers. Now I just have to figure out where my client's APs are. So like, uh, the cool thing about this community also for you newcomers is that no matter what time of day or what day it is, you go to Twitter, you post a question, and somebody within minutes will reply. Usually at somebody's either Jerry or Nick or you know, some of my peers like, hey, I have this problem. Then like, I don't know if they have no life or they're just too <laughs> proactive. Like, thank you, I appreciate that. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes, of course, I know we all have lives, but it's just that we are like, you know, connected all the time. So to find my APs, like in this case, I, they are well detected as my. So I'm gonna select all the access points. They're all selected now. 
I'm going to deselect from my. You're not my APs, even though you know you're listed as my. I just need to find my access point, the ones I'm after. Now let me introduce you to my best friend. My best friend is Quick Select. Sorry, Regis, you're not my best friend anymore. <laughs> Quick Select gives me so much more information, and I'm using Ekahao for this example. Here I can see the list of all the SSIDs that I saw while I was walking around. Yeah, I just need to find that one. Well, I know the SSID is active Wi-Fi, so I select active Wi-Fi. Close. Only the access points that are advertising my active Wi-Fi SSID are selected right now. Now we can see them. Not really. They're still like they're mixed up with everybody else. But they are selected. Out of the you know, 5,000 APs, they're all selected there. So what I'm going to do now is go to Actions, Select as My. Basically, I'm saying these APs that I have selected, make those My APs. Those are My APs. And what I'm going to do now is go to Project, Locate Surveyed Access Points, and I'm going to tell it only my access points, not the 4,000 of them, 5,000 of them, just my access points. The access points advertising my SSID. Ah! No! No, it should. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. Chill. Hey, don't <laughs> jinx it. <laughs> now. Yeah. Hey, it's 5,000 access points. Hey, hey can, can we speed that up, Jerry? <laughs> 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 have a little less data. <laughs> okay, now. I can just go to my list of APs, and those are my access points. Voila, now I can work you know, easier with just those. I can identify them, look at the names, rename them if I have to look specifically what, I, what I'm uh, after in this case. So one more thing, like I um, created a report uh, with uh, Nick, Nick Turner from Ekahao. Uh, I can just come and there is a, a brief uh, report template that we have that in this case, is going to go in and tell me how many APs and how many BSSIDs I have. In this small section, I have almost 5,000 access points and almost 10,000 BSSIDs. One more thing. Let me just look at the survey data here. I'm just going to go back to my survey tab. Look at these guys. And this will show me during my survey, of course, in this case, I did not do uh, spectrum analysis. Is my time up, probably? OK, so I'll wrap it up, because uh, I was going to show you another one, a really cool thing, but you know, I don't have time, so. OK, anyway, um, here, like if you have to design some of these areas, uh, on a pre-deployment survey, it's very common that you have to go and do a survey of the area just to see what you're up against. So you will have to find. APs existing out there, yours or not yours, and then see what is available and where would you land your access points, you know, depending where you are. I guess with that, my friends, I'm done. If you have any questions, I guess we can take them you know, during lunch or anything. Thank you very much. Thank you.